Hello and welcome to this video. Today I want to talk about how ChatGPT can help us as embedded software engineers and whether or not ChatGPT can actually replace software engineers or more particular embedded software engineers and will put us out of our jobs or maybe whether it's a great tool that we can use. So let's first look at what ChatGPT actually is and what itself says, uh, how it can help us. Then let's look at an example and then I will give you my assessment whether or not ChatGPT will put us out of our jobs. So let's get started with what is ChatGPT. So ChatGPT is created by OpenAI. So it's an artificial intelligence it's actually a very powerful language model that was trained by textual information and basically all the data that you can find in the World Wide Web. And the idea of ChatGPT and what is quite impressive to be honest is that you can interact with it as it is a human being. So you can ask questions and you get a response from it as if you were talking to a real person. And that of course is a lot of fun and of course feels very special and sophisticated. So now let's ask ChatGPT how it can be used by embedded software engineers. And as you can see, it's thinking before it's replying to your question. And you can also see by reading this answer that ChatGPT can do natural language processing and text analysis and language translation, that this is not really something embedded software engineers would do, right? So this is not necessarily something that would help us in our daily life. Similarly, content creation or voice recognition, while those are nice features, and you can use them, for instance, as content creator. Unfortunately, it is not really helpful when you are an embedded software engineer. Okay, so apparently ChatGPT doesn't have a good idea what it can actually do to help us. But of course, I have an idea what it can do to help us. What it can do is it can, first of all, create code. It can generate code. So if you ask it to write or solve a particular problem with code, it will create code that it tries to solve that problem. So that's number one, generate code. The second aspect is it can actually help you optimizing and reviewing code. So you can, in theory, give JetGPT the code that you have written and then ask for recommendations on how to improve it, how to optimize it for memory consumptions, how to make it more maintainable, more readable and so on. The problem I see with that obviously is that when you are an embedded software engineer and you're not working on an open source project, you probably don't want to upload your code to ChatGPT. And then the fourth item is debugging. Um, so when you have a problem, when you get maybe an error message, a compiler error or a compiler warning, then you can ask ChatGPT for more information about this compiler warning and how to resolve that compiler warning or that compiler error and it might help you. But again, this works best if ChatGPT has also access to your code. So you're back at the problem that you would need to upload your source code to ChatGPT, which is probably a thing you don't want to do or at least your employer doesn't want you to do. So as I said, one thing ChatGPT can do is it can generate source code for a particular problem. So let's try whether that works for a simple embedded example. So I will now ask it to read temperature with an ESP microcontroller. So let's see what it comes up with. So the first good news is it tells us that in addition to the microcontroller, we also need a temperature sensor 
right? So that's already great. It gives us even the sensor model here and um, it explains us how to use this. Now it outputs the code and of course this delayed response is giving us the sense that it's actually just writing this for us. Probably it would also be possible to just dump the whole response immediately without this waiting. But of course this gives us the feeling that we actually talk to a real human being and not just to a machine. So now it has written reasonable code um, that would with an ESP8266 read temperature. So now let's say I don't have the DS18B20 handy, but I want to use a DHT11. So now it rewrites the code to read the temperature with a DHT11 sensor. So that's something of course that you can Google and you can find those kind of code segments online. But you will see in a second that there are things that are very powerful here in ChatGPT that are not as easy to replicate with a Google search. Let's just say we want to now filter the temperature value. Basically we want to add a moving average that filters our temperature value. Let's ask JetGPT whether it can do this for us. I always feel that I should add a please uh, to my commands because yeah, it really feels like you are writing or chatting with a real human being. And I hope that JetGPT is not angry when I don't say please when I'm giving my commands. So you see it now adds a moving average with a window size of five and adds this now to our code. And this is something that's hard to do with Google. So basically what you can find with Google is you can find fragments of code, but you can't ask Google to add things to your already existing code. Right? So I think that's one great thing here about ChatGPT that it is able to add things to the existing code. Okay, now it's done. Now it has added the moving average. What at least ChatGPT claims is that it's also knowledgeable about the context that this code is running on. So now let's ask ChatGPT how we can further optimize this code to run in an embedded system. And let's look at the suggestions that it will give us. And here we can already see with the proposal to use fixed point arithmetic rather than floating point that it is aware of some of the special characteristics of embedded systems and is able to optimize the code this way. Similarly, using a circular buffer instead of an array can reduce the memory consumption. That of course also is important when working with embedded systems. Okay, that's great. So now we have the code. Of course, now we also need to create a pinout and need to know how to connect this to our ESP. And also this is something it can help us with and explains us how we now need to do the connection between the ESP and our DHT11 sensor. So that's quite interesting. And also I think personally a helpful tool. Let's say we are happy with our code and we want to take it even one step further. Let's ask ChatGPT whether it can write Google tests for our source code. So now I've asked ChatGPT to write a Google test code that checks whether the moving average that we have implemented is actually working and it starts to create a Google test suite. Unfortunately, this Google test code is not really testing the implementation above. So we see there are some shortcomings and you can't blindly trust ChatGPT. So you still need to understand what it actually does. Coming to the conclusion, yes, ChatGPT is a very powerful tool for embedded software engineers and it is really helpful when you know the right commands, right? And how to query it and how to reuse the results. 
And it can be much more powerful than Google combined with Stack Overflow to solve coding problems for sure. But similarly to Google and Stack Overflow, ChatGPT has not the potential to replace embedded software engineers or software engineers in general. If at all, it will make our life as software engineers maybe easier. It will help us with some of the problems we are facing. And of course, imagine what we could do if something like this would be integrated into our IDE and we were sure that we can let it know how our code is looking like without disclosing confidential information and what kind of superpower that would be to have something like ChatGPT integrated into your IDE, doing code reviews as you write the code, helping you optimizing the code, helping you debugging, giving you suggestions. Um, that of course is something to look forward to, but it will never replace an actual software engineer. So I hope you enjoyed this video about ChatGPT. Have you already tried ChatGPT? If you have, let me know in the comments below. If you have liked this video, found it entertaining or uh, have learned something new, then please give it a like. Apparently this helps the YouTube algorithm. And of course, if you are interested in more videos just like this one, then please consider subscribing so that I can see you in the next video. Thank you and see you soon.